Hello, everybody. A joy always to meet you here at our Advent Life YouTube page. It's been great to see you face to face, not all of you, but a good number of you every Saturday at 2 p.m. And we are continuing to do that today at 2 p.m. and every Saturday as long as we can and as long as the numbers keep going down. We hope um, to see you. So know that your, the, our doors are open um, every Saturday at 2 p.m. Our online meetings also um, are there for those who want to remain home. And as promised, the sermons will be up on YouTube every Saturday as well. But just know that wherever you are, what a joy to meet you here. And if you miss us, please come and visit us so that we might see you again. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are watching from or, you know, what's going on in your life. But know that even when it doesn't seem so, uh, we, we miss you. You are, your, your absence is felt. So I hope all of you who are watching are doing well and know that our doors are open again. It will be a joy to see you. Today let's pray and let us move forward. Dear God, we thank you for another day of life. We are already in October, and what a year 2020 has been. There's so much happening in the world. There's so much happening down the street. There's so much happening within all of us. So give us the assurance again today that you have not abandoned us, that we are not alone, and that you have a plan for this world, for the history of humanity. And we are walking toward that resolution by your hand and by your mercy and grace. We pray for those who are sick, for those who are struggling with loneliness and so many problems. Even the president of the country, his wife, have come down with COVID. And we pray for them and for everyone around the world, across America, that are struggling with this horrible disease. May your hand be upon them. And may they know that you are who you are. Bless us now as we open your word and guide us through the gospel of Matthew by your spirit so that we might learn to live as living reminders of Jesus. That is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. So very good. Today we keep our journey walking through the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and, it, and what a journey it has been. It's been. We started earlier this year, early this year, and now we're getting to chapter 9, finishing up chapter 9 today, actually. Um, and it's good. It'll be good to revisit some of these things. And now that I'm thinking of it, I should have left a little more space on the board, but hey, let's just go. Last week um, was a hard, a hard teaching. Why? Because it was a hard teaching to the Pharisees and to those who were listening to Jesus. Jesus was uncovering part of the creation of his new world, of inviting people to dwell in that new reality, involves exposing the deep sins of society, the deep sins that were expressed by that group of Pharisees of complete disregard for human life and for the restoration of human beings. So Jesus put his finger on that sensitive spot. They thought they were just accusing Jesus of healing a man through the power of demons because that was their theology, their assessment, based on greed, based on whatever was happening within them. But Jesus uncovered, exposed this deep sin of the Pharisees that still runs down throughout history and is still present in our society today. The risk of committing this sin against the Holy Spirit is signaled by our insensibility to everything that pertains to the freedom, the liberation of human beings. So when we are unbothered, when we do not react, when we are not hurt, when we do not feel pain for the injustices that happen around the world and in our neighborhoods, that could be a sign of our insensibility to the work of the Spirit altogether, to the work of the kingdom of heaven, which, according to Jesus, we should seek first above all other things. So my work as a pastor, again, is not to guide you toward a political perception of reality. My job is to uncover, to explain 
the politics of the kingdom of heaven and what that means for our society and for our life today, recognizing that Jesus is Lord. And if that claim is true, then we must live up to the fact that the community of faith is an alternative to the kingdoms of men and not part of it. It's a hard job. And I feel for my brothers and my sisters who are pastoring other congregations across America who are also seeing the division, the polarization that is found in society within the Christian community. And it pains me, it hurts me to see that happening. So we need to be closer to one another as much as possible in these days so that we might not forget what binds us together as a community of faith. What binds us together as a community of faith is nothing more, nothing less than Jesus Christ, His righteousness and the fact that He is Lord. And we abide and live by the principles of another kingdom, not seen in the kingdoms of men. So to lose this sensibility to the work of the Spirit, to the principles of the kingdom, to sensibility to the freedom and liberation and well-being of human beings, to lose that means living below what we were created to be. It means becoming numb toward everyone and everything that reduces the humanity of others. So today we move forward to discover again what the ministry of Jesus was all about and what our ministry as His body, as the body of Christ, should be all about as well. So let's read together our text Very short text today, but so much to talk about. Today we conclude chapter 9, and next week we'll begin chapter 10. So the text read as this. This is Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and all villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdoms of men are, are not all there is to reality, the good news, that we can experience that real kingdom of heaven that is to come in the future, but that is a reality, that we can access that reality today and live by it today on earth as things are in heaven. So he went out preaching, proclaiming this gospel of the kingdom, and with it, healing every disease and every affliction. Why? Because again, when the good news, when the reality of the kingdom of heaven comes into, breaks through the reality of the kingdoms of men, the principles, the realities that are found there suddenly appear in our broken world. So in the future kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, there is no disease or sickness. So Jesus brings that into the present through his life and actions. Verse 36, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So there you go. Again, Jesus goes out. The ministry of Jesus is about the kingdom, about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. How does he do it? Talked about it just now. He goes out teaching, talking about who God is, healing diseases, afflictions. He faces the real world, the broken world that we experience right now by the principles and realities of another kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. So wherever there is abuse, Jesus brings freedom, as we saw time and time again in our readings. Where there is anxiety and fear, Jesus brings peace. Where there is sickness, Jesus brings healing. Where there is oppression, Jesus brings justice. He brings mercy. So yeah, so but we've read something quite similar to this, to our reading today before, and and I'll I'll quickly go there. In Matthew chapter 4, verses, verse 23, 
right at the end of the temptations of Jesus. The text says, And He went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So His fame spread out. So in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, He's baptized. We saw that. You can look back at our messages. He is tempted in the wilderness. Very good. The beginning of Jesus' ministry, the description of it, is very similar to, to what we just read in chapter 9 today. So it seems... But there is something happening here. It's like a conclusion. This section is a conclusion of a, of a big section in Matthew that began in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and on, onward, right? So this is where it started. Start and then conclusion. So what is, what is starting here and what is concluding here? Well, basically, the, 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 the first initial description of Matthew uh, regarding Jesus' ministry is, again, that Jesus had authority, that he was who he, who he claimed he was. He was the promised Messiah, the one who was to come. And yes, from, from chapters 5 to 7, that's, when we, that's where we saw the, 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 this big chunk is the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus... So Jesus has authority to teach. So his teaching has authority. And then from chapters 8 all the way through 9 now, we, we saw, that's the healings, um, that Jesus has authority over, over reality. He is creating a new world. So two big sections um, in between 4.23 and 9, 5 to 7, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has authority to teach his words carry a power, a description of reality that people never heard or had forgotten. Chapter 8 and 9, Jesus goes out and heals and cures diseases and even, even nature obeys his voice. So it seems like this big first chunk in the, in the story and the narrative of Matthew is, let me, let me show you, let me, let, me, let me write about who this Jesus is. He has authority to speak and that's the Sermon on the Mount. And, and it's not just about blah, blah, blah. It's not about words. Now look at how he's going to live and start start recreating the world and, and redraw, drawing the lines again of religion and customs and how to deal with tradition and other people who, are, who don't believe like we do. Jesus recreates this world and, and his actions speak loud as well. So that's sort of what we have today. Today, in the, at the ending of chapter 9, we end this big section here. How do we know? Very similar words. Matthew repeats it. So yes, so today, obviously, in our text, chapter 9, we saw, obviously, this description of Jesus' ministry that we saw before. And then the text says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. So today, it's quite interesting. We're going to read and understand that the ministry of Jesus involved one very important thing, which was driving the ministry of Jesus, his service toward others was this one little word that we read right here, which is crucial, and the word is compassion. Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion. Jesus had deep compassion toward people. His ministry was a ministry. The ministry of Jesus was a ministry of compassion. Yep, there you go. That's what it was all about. Jesus was always carrying with him deep compassion. So the question is now, what is compassion? Yeah, we ask a lot of questions here in our community. Because obviously I can say you had compassion, and then what normally happens in our brain, you'll think of, oh yeah, I know what, you, you, we, we don't even think. We already interpret what compassion is without giving it much thought. So the question is, what is compassion? This is not obviously pity or a simple feeling of, of, oh, I'm sorry, or, or at least not in the Greek language of, 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 of the word here, compassion. The word in the Greek, actually, I wrote it on the board. It's very weird. Can you pronounce this? Try it. Try it at home. And then imagine me laughing, because it took me a while, too. It's not an easy word, so don't, don't feel bad. So, but try to, try to pronounce this word under the, uh, in the red box here. Uh, it's, it's very hard, but when, it, when you get it, it comes out. It's splachnizomai. Splachnizomai. What a weird word. Yeah, that's a huge word in the Greek. It's a very simple word in English. It means compassion. That's, that's the translation of the word. And the first part of this word in the Greek simply means the gut, the internal organs that we have inside of us. So while we may think that compassion, again, is this little feeling 
or some inside illumination that we gain through reason or perception of reality, it's not quite accurate. The best expression that we have in the English language for this compassion is it's this feeling of a gut-wrenching feeling. It's an internal pain, anguish. So gut-wrenching is the, is the expression that comes to mind. So to experience, to live with compassion is to feel deeply, to feel physically for people and their condition. To have compassion is literally to suffer with. It's not when we drive by somebody who's struggling or we call somebody and learn about their pains and we feel bad for them. No, this compassion here is deep, gut-wrenching pain, suffering with those who are suffering. And let's just, let's just say the truth here, guys. We do not want suffering, right? So, so if the ministry of Jesus is a ministry of compassion, and the word for compassion is splechnizomai, that has to do with this deep anguish that means suffering with. We don't want that, do we? We want something else. We want a ministry that, that doesn't involve pain for us, obviously. Yeah. Why is that? Well, our society is moved by the illusion that suffering can be abolished through, I don't know what, YouTube yoga, through painkillers, through a bunch of other things. And don't get me wrong, a lot of good, good solutions. Therapy is a great one to speak with somebody. Truth of the matter is we don't like suffering. It's not in our DNA in a modern society, we avoid suffering as best as we can. Um, so yeah, we do our best not to get involved with it. We don't feel well with it. And yet, there you go. This is exactly what the ministry of Jesus is and was all about. Suffering with others. Hmm. More on this later. We have to move forward few questions. Text is saying that Jesus saw the crowds he had carried with him. This deep splagnitzomai feeling of gut-wrenching pain when, we saw the, when he saw the people suffering. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, the text says. So two big questions are on the board. Tiago, I understand compassion, deep suffering with this commitment for the condition of the others, this preoccupation for the freedom and liberation of humanity. But the question here is for us to understand the context. What, I mean, who are the sheep and, and who are the shepherds? I mean, what is going on here? Why is Jesus using this language? Is it just because? Who are the sheep? Who are we to suffer with? Who did Jesus suffer with? And who are these shepherds? And why are they absent? Jesus looks at the crowd and feels this gut-wrenching pain for them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. So where are the shepherds? Who are they? Questions that we need to consider today. So let's begin with the first one. Who are the sheep? Very easy. text tells us. The answer to the first question is very simple. Jesus was with everyone concerned with everyone, feeling compassion over everyone who can come under the description of harassed and helpless. That's what the text says. They were harassed and helpless like sheep. That's Jesus' description. Who are the sheep? Well, everyone who is harassed and helpless, they are the sheep. They were the primary object, focus of Jesus' work. So here, obviously, we need to make the immediate jump. If we are to do what Jesus did in the past as the body of Christ today, we must begin with the question, who are the harassed and helpless today? 
around us. Who are they? Who are the sheep without a shepherd? Who are they who are subject to constant attacks from wolves? Who are interested in devoiding them of everything that they have? Their life, their belongings, the meaning of their existence. Who are they who live without any protection in our society? They are the harassed and helpless. Jesus was interested in them. Are we aware of who they are? Because these are the inconsistencies of religion today. Religion has become a club. And yet Jesus' ministry was about suffering with those who were harassed and helpless. How different from what we grow up thinking religion to be. This is important, obviously, because when we raise these important questions... We are bridging biblical reality with our current modern society and all of its craziness. This is where the Bible ceases to be a little spiritual book about personal spiritual lessons for you and me. And this is where the Bible becomes a book about a deeper spirituality. One that has to do with life now and not only life in the future. One that has to do with how we see and perceive the world and reality around us and how much we feel with our guts the effects of the sins, of the deep sins of our society around us. This is about how well we join and suffer with those who are harassed and helpless. The question is, do we know who they are? Because if we don't, then we're living within a religious illusion. We're living uh, under the possibility of a fake religion that has to do about our well-being and our best interest within a consumer-oriented society. Very little to do with the ministry of Jesus, which was a ministry of compassion toward those who were harassed and helpless. So if we don't even know who the harassed and helpless are, how are we even to do ministry or feel compassion to Truth of the matter is that maybe we have deep compassion. We feel deeply for other things. That was sort of the talk we had last week, wasn't it? We consider other things sin. We become enraged and bothered by so many other things that have nothing to do with the harassed and helpless. With those who truly are the object of attention of God and Jesus. So yeah. Who are the harassed and helpless? Are we suffering with them? That was the ministry of Jesus. Is it ours? That's always the question. So the sheep, very easy, are the harassed and helpless, no matter the color, the geographical area, the political preference, the appearance, appearance, external appearance, their past mistakes, their present mistakes, doesn't matter. If they fall under the category of harassed and helpless, They are the object of God's attention and they are the object of ours. That's the sadness of the social, political, religious reality in America and in the West altogether today. We have redefined who the harassed and helpless are according to our personal conceptions and political leanings to the point that harassed and helpless are not defined by Jesus anymore. This is truly sad. So we need to become sensitive to the Spirit, sensitive to the work of God, sensitive to the principles of the kingdom so that we might have eyes to see. And not only see, but read and interpret and perceive what's happening around us. Or else we will never be able to live in contemporaneity with Jesus as if Jesus was here with us, living and working through and in us for others. The harassed, And the helpless. So yeah. The question now is, who are the shepherds? We know who the sheep are. So where are the shepherds? Who are these guys? Where did they go? Jesus says they are like sheep without a shepherd. So there you go. Obviously, in these words, Jesus is quoting several texts in the Old Testament 
Among them, I have written them on the board, Ezekiel 34, which seems to be drawing. Ezekiel was younger than Jeremiah. So maybe drawing from Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1 and 8. So let me just read that to you. Jeremiah chapter 23. I love to speak online because there's no time to end. So you can pause, go grab a water. I love it. When people are here, I, I tend to rush things. I get, I get the impression they're hungry and sleepy, which is a phenomenal thing. But let me read quickly to you here, Jeremiah 23, verse 1 to 8. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold... I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all of the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. Genesis wording, they will flourish like I intended them to back in creation. I will set shepherds over them in those days who will care for them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord is our righteousness, therefore behold, the days are coming, declare the Lord's, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven, then they shall dwell in their own Land. So there you go, Jeremiah talking about a situation where the people of Israel were scattered, were, were abandoned by the leaders, by the shepherds. So we have an idea that there's something here and a promise that one day God would raise a branch from David. And we know that all of these things, Matthew is, has all of these things in his mind and Israel does too, that Jesus is now this shepherd that is coming along and doing these things. But let's wait. We're still thinking about who, who are the shepherds. It seems from this text that they are leaders, maybe kings. I mean, who, who is responsible for the people? Very interesting. So let's read Numbers. That's our second text. So we read Jeremiah. Let's go back to Numbers. Back in the Pentateuch, back with Moses, back before the people were going into the promised land. Um, so yes, Numbers chapter 27 Verse 16 and 17, this is about Joshua succeeding Moses, who was about to die, a new leader for Israel. So there's a big hint. Verse 16, Numbers 27, 16. Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep, that have no shepherd. So there you go, even back in Moses. This image of the shepherd is the image of a leader. It could be a religious leader. It could be a political. Joshua had both functions. He was the political leader of Israel, making decisions, taking care of the judges of, 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 of the, among the people, the elders, giving them spiritual insight. They were the embodiment of the word of God. And also, they, so they carried this double function. Not only politics of what to do with the people, where to go, to lead them out and bring them in, but they also had this spiritual responsibility as well. So it, it seems that these are the overseers, the leaders of the people. These are the shepherds. They are to lead them out like a shepherd and bring people in as pastors and sheep. Beautiful image. So now I think we're ready to read Ezekiel. Yes. Now we're ready to go to Ezekiel chapter 34. Long text. I could have you read at home, but why, why not read it together? Ezekiel chapter 34. Verse 1 to 15. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. So there you go. It seems that over history, over time, 
these leaders were to be the embodiment of the Word of God, who were to lead people, not only spiritually, but in their dealings, in their economy, in the implementation of the laws of God that had to do with all the, the aspects of social living, everything. They had corrupted themselves. So Ezekiel is to speak against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord, of, the Lord God, ah, oh, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves. Should not the shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool of your sheep. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. You slaughter them. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled over them. So they were scattered. Because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep but the shepherds have fed themselves and not have shed my sheep, therefore you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherd feed themselves I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they not be, be made food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep. And I, God, will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered. So I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness, and I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights, Israel shall be grazing their land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. And on a rich pasture, they shall feed on the mountains. I myself will be their shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. And I will blind up the injured. And I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. So here again, what a great continuation from last week. While the Pharisees were part of the shepherds, part of the leadership. So it's not only the Pharisees. It's the Sadducees. It's the priests. It's the Roman emperors that are dealing. All of them can be found under the umbrella of shepherds. The one who have responsibilities toward people like the kings of Israel and like Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. All of them have responsibility before God because they are taking care of human beings. Creation. Creatures made by the hands of God. So obviously, God is enraged. Why? Because instead of taking care of the sheep, these shepherds can only think about themselves. Have we heard about this? Oh yes, we have. In the religious world, sure. In the political world. <laughs> oh my Lord, yes. There are many harassed and helpless around us. Like sheep without a shepherd. And the abuse, the neglect, the disregard of these leaders of society, both religious and non-religious, can be felt in America and in the world today. They are worried about other things and the promise, obviously, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel is that God Himself would come down and bring them back together. And obviously, this is what we find here. God promises that He would shepherd the, the, the sheep, that He would come, that He would be the one who would feed the sheep in justice. Because justice matters to God. More than a lot of other things that we consider important. And this is what is happening with Jesus. The assessment of Jesus. He sees the crowd 
And then he brings the language of Ezekiel, of Jeremiah, of Numbers, saying, here are my people. I feel deep pain for them. I am enraged at what is happening because they are scattered. Nobody cares for them. They only care about themselves. These shepherds are nowhere to be found. All they do is exploit the sheep for their own interests. Jesus will have none of it. So while the sheep are the harassed and the helpless, the shepherds are the leaders who are nowhere to be found. And when they are found, they live to take advantage of the sheep. And Jesus himself now embodies the presence of God in the midst of the sheep. So what is the big deal here? It's a huge deal. You just read Ezekiel. He lists all of the sins of the shepherds. Just like in Israel, back in the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the leaders at the time of Jesus were committing the same sins, very similar to the times of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Curiously, these sins continue to be real and practice more than ever today, both in religious and political leadership. These sins led to the abuse and still lead to the abandonment and the abuse of sheep. What are these sins? One, two, three. There are more, but let's just sum it up. These shepherds, these leaders, are all about feeding themselves. They have a responsibility toward the other because that is God's economy. The well-being of the other is directly attached to mine. And when I have complete disregard for the other, that's just a little red flag, a little sign that I don't care about God or anything that belongs to Him, including human beings who bear His image. So these shepherds don't care about feeding the flock. They care about feeding themselves. That's sin number one. Sin number two, the sheep are suffering. The sheep are sick. The sheep, are, the sheep are, being, are being abandoned. They, they struggle with disease. But they're not worried. They're worried, again, about themselves. So there you go. It's not only about sustenance, the very basic of what it means to live. But no, even when they are suffering and not being able to function as sheep, they don't care. They're, no, they, they, they're insensitive to the situation of the sheep. So they don't feed them. And obviously, because they're not fed, they're going to get sick. So it's a deeper layer that they're insensitive to. Couldn't care less. So they don't feed. They're worried only about themselves. They don't care for the situation of the sheep because of lack of nourishment. And number three, they rule with ruthlessness. What is this? What does it mean that they rule, that they lead with ruthlessness? What does that mean? Very simple. Even the wool of the sheep. So they don't feed. So the, 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 the sheep are hungry. Number two, they don't care for their needs, their health, their well-being. Couldn't care less. Does that ring a bell? It still happens. We don't care. We don't feed them. We don't care about the basic needs that human beings have. Number two, because they don't feed, they don't have the basic, they get sick, they get strayed, they get, get, they, they get away from, from regular life, and we don't care. Leaders don't care. they just worried about themselves. And number three, even the very basic things that the sheep still have, the wool, the, the protection that they have around themselves, the shepherds go out, clean them out, take the wool, and leave them abandoned exploited, disadvantaged. So those are the sins practiced in the days of Israel. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, these are the sins practiced at the time of Jesus, and these are the same deep sins that we find in our society today. So obviously this is quite depressive now, isn't it? Yeah. So what is the solution? Very, very hard to have hope. It's because this has been happening Century after century, millennia after millennia, it is the human condition. So what is the solution? I don't think there is a clear solution, but we can read the text and try to figure out what Jesus does. God sends Jesus. That's number one, very important, to show what a true shepherd does. A true shepherd has a one simple, basic characteristic, compassion. Splachnizomai deep, gut-wrenching pain toward the condition of sheep. 
that leads them to live for the sheep. So yeah, God sends Jesus to show humanity who God is. The very presence of God, the true shepherd, as promised, is now here. And in chapter 10, which we will begin next week, Jesus will send his own disciples out to tend the lost sheep. Not as shepherds, interestingly, but as sheep. Why? Because this is ministry, according to Jesus. Jesus will teach the disciples that the people around them are like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus will send them in chapter 10 as sheep in the midst of the very wolves that are devouring the sheep. So it's interesting. Jesus doesn't say, I will send you like good shepherds. No, he is the good shepherd. He is God among men showing humanity how to live for others. But Jesus sends the disciples now, not as shepherds, but as sheep, in the midst of wolves. Beautiful image. We'll talk about it next week, but let me give you a glimpse of what that means now. Why do they go out as sheep in the midst of wolves and not as shepherds? No, the disciples go to the sheep as sheep in the midst of wolves. Why? To suffer. To suffer with the sheep. To suffer under the rulership of false shepherds who feed themselves, who are worried about themselves, and who rule with ruthlessness. Why are the disciples sent as sheep? So that they can split nizomai. So that they can experience compassion and live a ministry of gut-wrenching pain for other people. Baffles me that I still have to explain this to a congregation. Not here, but wherever you are listening to this, it's unbelievable how disconnected we are from the pains of human beings. Thinking that we are practicing a religion before God that is truly blasphemous toward everything that God represents and does. So we are sent out. The disciples are sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Why? Because we are to suffer and to do a ministry of compassion. To find those who are harassed and helpless and to suffer with them. The solution of God is revolutionary because it simply does not make sense. The solution would be to, to, to make all the ruthless shepherds disappear. But no, Jesus sends the disciples to suffer. To remind the sheep that they're not alone. And that one day there will be a resolution. Powerful. Powerful description of what ministry is. Sheep in the midst of wolves. Jesus concludes the text saying, yes, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Not everybody wants to do this. Therefore, pray. Because the movement into ministry happens from prayer. From a deep commitment to the God, the true shepherd. To abide in Him to the point that we find meaning in life and suffering with those who are suffering around us. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Hey, when I was younger, this text meant that we need more pastors to baptize more people. Laborers. But notice how the words of Jesus here are within the context of those who again are helpless and harassed. Sheep and shepherds. The abused and the marginalized. Those whose society has forgotten and discarded. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So what does Jesus do? Well, we'll see it in chapter 10. Jesus is going to prepare a new Israel. His 12 disciples, like the 12 tribes, who will embody this ministry and do what Jesus did. The question is, they were willing, after a long time, to embrace suffering and die for Jesus by taking care of the sheep. That will be the chat Jesus will have with Peter in the end. Do you love me? Then take care of my sheep. Soon later, Peter would die. I tell you, man.
I don't, I don't think we understand what following Jesus is all about. I truly don't. I question myself sometimes. If you love me, take care of my... That's the one thing that Jesus is worried about. The last thing he says. If you love me, well, take care of my sheep. Do what I did. Suffer. Takes a while for Peter to understand, but when he does, he dies for them as Jesus. So the question truly is, are we willing to redefine what ministry is and join Jesus in His ministry of suffering with and for others? How countercultural is this in a society that avoids suffering? Are we willing to embrace our cross and die for others? Even if we lose our credibility, even if we lose our reputation in the eyes of others, when we are embracing those who our society has taught us is the enemy. Society has been entrapped in social media prisons, thinking that community happens there in front of screens where you voice and affirm opinions of men imprisoned in an online world every day, all around, without realizing that people are lonely, that people are suffering, that people in the house next door and down the street have real needs, that people crave meaningful and real connections. So the question is, will we join Jesus in the ministry of online disconnection? From all that is fake, to suffer with real people in the real world today. I wonder if we know more of the stories of what is happening around the world and in our computer screens more than the stories of our neighbors, our family members, and the people who are close to us and who tell us that love us. Do we know them? Do we trust them? Are we there for them? It's not hard, guys. This week I did what I normally do called some people, visited some people. Called one church member that went through a lot this year. Said, how are you doing? How's your day? I'm calling you just to remind you that you're not alone and that we're here. Prayed with that person. I think the call took three or four minutes. Before I hung up, the person just, just said, Pastor, before you go, I just wanted to say that that made my day. It's not hard. It's not hard to be suffering and with people. The hard thing is to disconnect from all that is fake. The hard thing is to subvert our fake conceptions of religion and God to live a ministry of suffering with those who are harassed and helpless because of religious, non-religious, political, non-political leaders who are out there to perform the sins that I have written on the board. They don't care about the feeding of the helpless and harassed. They don't care about the, the health of the helpless and harassed. And everything they have, if they get an opportunity, they'll take. Still happens. Still happening now, and people just want connection. They just want to know that they're not alone. Are we doing that? Am I doing that? Jesus' ministry was a ministry of compassion, splagnitzamai, deep, gut wrenching pain for people. What society truly needs cannot be found online, so may we disconnect and be with people where they are. Because there are many who are still living as sheep without a shepherd. So the question is not where are the shepherds. We know them now. 
the question is, where is the body of Christ? Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you. I truly don't know what I would do without the gospel of Jesus. I truly do not know what would be. It's so hard to live as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus, as a human being in the world today. But thank you for reminding us of Jesus and his compassion for people so that we might confront Jesus and his calling for us to join him in that ministry. So may we choose and may we follow. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.